to uh, call the meeting to order. So um, we are continuing on with the uh, with the hearing that was commenced on September 21st, and uh, we have uh, I think three uh, appellants before us today. First one being Carl Hammer. Uh, I should ask, does everybody have the rules of procedure and did everybody get the uh, materials that, uh, that were sent out today? Yes. Great. And uh, I actually think I'm missing the latest in discussion with, with um, about the changes that were proposed. So how, I don't know how that the changes the, well the consolidation of 1860 and 1996 oh, oh the, the record card right. so i haven't sent that to you because it's not official until um errors and omissions at the end okay of the uh, yeah procedurally i don't understand how it comes in here okay if it does okay i don't know i don't think i have the hammer materials with me so if you have an extra set Oh, I have there's, that person. There's, there's, oh, there's is there packet. something else? There's okay. <laughs> there's one about 1860 uh, that I haven't seen. This is all great. Thanks. Okay, so Mr. Hammer, I'll start off by asking you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm, subject to the pains and penalties of perjury, that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Very well. So what did we say? We're, we're having uh, the assessor start? Yeah. Typical. Okay. I mean, unless you, unless well, that's, you that's fine. Well, I'll actually have you sworn, sworn in, too. Do you solemnly affirm? Testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. All right. Um, so first property is 18, 1860 Main Street was purchased by um, Carl Hammer. The grand list value currently is 324.8 as set by the reappraisal contractor. Um, on the sheet, it describes the property. It's a 29-acre lot, slightly sloping in a traffic average neighborhood. Um, we talked about that a little bit over the, the last couple of meetings. Um, it's a little old, it has a little old house built in 1932. The home is rated as fair. Um, the reappraisal contractor did get, uh, at least poked his head in and talked to the, there is a tenant there in the home. Um, home is heated with a propane fired wall heater. It's graded C for, for average quality build. Um, the one comp that I can find, uh, because it is sort of a unique property, uh, it's a small house with a large lot. Um, the first one on there is 2900 Elm Street. Um, that one sold for $400,000. Um, breaks down to $240 a square foot. The uh, subject property is assessed at $284 a square foot with 29 acres. Um, so the difference in the lot size is going to be... Um, where that difference in square footage comes in. The second page contains the equity comparison as far as the assessments. Um, the first one is an abutting property, um, 104 Gidney Place. It is, it's a larger piece of land. Um, it abuts um, the Hammer property. It, the house is, is not habitated at the moment, and I don't think it could be. It's given a very poor uh, condition, it's almost uh, worthless, I'll say. That one comes in at $295 a square foot. Um, Gould Hill Road is the second one that's, that's comparable at $271 a square foot, similar size lot. Um, the study assessment on the subject, like I said, is at $282 a square foot. Uh, now, Mr. Hammer purchased this property in 22. And per state statute, this should have been combined with his homestead at 1996 uh, Main Street. So that's going to be handled through errors and omissions um, before the end of this year. And that's going to lower the assessment of um, 1860 to 199.5. Uh, by combining the, this, the state's theory on this is when you combine um, two lots, 
it makes the, the per value of the, of the land lower. Um, one thing, another thing Mr. Hammer mentioned is that there's a tenant in the property. Um, we were not, the, the appraisal contractor wasn't given any information about any adverse possession claims um, by the tenant. And I don't know if the tenant is a squatter or a tenant at sufferance. Um, that's going to be something for you guys to decide. I'm not a, a legal expert, but a, um, a squatter is someone that knowingly moves into an abandoned home um, and is there for 15 years and can file an adverse possession claim. Um, a tenant at sufferance is someone who lived there at one point but won't leave, and they cannot file uh, an adverse possession claim uh, according to the state. And that's that's all we have on this property. Thanks. You're up. Can I ask a oh, yeah. So on the one off for kidney place, you said you would call that property almost worthless. The home. So that is that's value of three hundred and thirty six thousand dollars is based on the acreage? Yes. Um, and there is also a positive view adjustment made to 104. Um, it does have a better view, um, so there's, there's a positive adjustment made to the, um, to the land as well. And is this a property that could be uh, subdivided? Do you know? I am, I'm sure it could be. I don't know for sure. I'm not up on the zoning. But. Okay. Are you talking about Mr. Hammers? Or? Yeah, the subject property. Oh, I don't see why it couldn't. I, I don't know. Okay, yeah. thanks. Any other questions from members? This is 29 acres, 29 and a half acres. Correct. 29.6. Yes. What? 29.6. Yeah. That's yeah. All right, Mr. Hammer. So, um, I, I, as background, I bought it in July of 22 settlement with an estate for $188,000, which was negotiated um, with the estate. Um, um, the negotiation to buy that piece of land had been ongoing for about 28 years. Um, and um, anyway, in, in the event, um, we settled with the estate for that $188,000. Um, which, among other things, uh, required in the closing and settlement that I take accept responsibility for the adverse possession claim of the tenant in the house that I would hold the state harmless. And uh, uh, so um, the reappraisal to 300 some odd seemed quite extreme to me in terms of the value. It's, um, if, if the appraisal is supposed to be a fair market value assessment and the tenant in the house has been there for almost 30 years and was uh, asked to leave repeatedly over the period of time that she lived there, um, lives there now. Um, and so as I understand Vermont law, she has a substantial claim to adverse possession. She has been in open, notorious, and hostile occupation of the premises for more than 15 years. Um, so I held the estate harmless for that value when I purchased the place. Uh, and that was part of the, uh, the value de determination and the negotiation to get to the 188,000. So I question whether that place can, if, if Rosanna was properly represented, her rights are substantial at, at the minimum, the house and the house lot acreage. Um, so that's, I had been under the misunderstanding that, um, that the actual transaction price was an important consideration if it was relatively recent. I've since heard that because it was an abutting piece of land and because it was not advertised in certain ways as being for sale, though there were, I mean, it was known that it was for sale. It, the whole uh, 
it was a relatively, um, there were multiple um, uh, beneficiaries in the estate that, that uh, had it, and some of them were certainly shopping it, as it were, to others. Um, so anyway, I believed, I believed at that point that, that it was a, that I had a reasonable claim that the real estate is, uh, as it currently exists is not marketable as described without accounting for the likely significant cost of settling the claim of that tenant. And I, well, I, I actually looked at um, the Gidney place and thought the Gidney place, I mean, it is an abutting place. I, I thought that the land value there was substantially higher. It's much better land, much more usable land, with uh, uh, better access and uh, and better views. So that, I added that to my concern. Um, this the person who's living there. You and uh, Marty both referred to her as a tenant. Um, do you know? how she initially came to live on the property and what she thinks, what she says about her possession of the property? Yeah, I, I do. We, uh, uh, we were married um, and uh, remained neighbors and co-parents. Um, the, um, so the house, the land was originally purchased by the now deceased prior owner with the intention of um, uh, locating a co-housing project. Uh, and uh, at the time, in, interested and involved in that project, we, this is, um, I think this was 94, we walked over the land and uh, made that Don uh, aware that um, that there were that it was that while it was a kind of tertiary tillage hill farm in Vermont, it had substantial farming potential, um, and that in the concept of the co-housing project that was proposed, we should, as we said at the time, find the footprint of the farm and build infrastructure for housing in such a way that it would support, not damage, the farming potential of, of the land. And uh, we undertook at that time to start working that piece of land with, to, to start to uh, so mow it, uh, plowed and fertilized parts of it, put some crops on it, and started utilizing the house. Um, with a to be ultimately defined uh, leasehold uh, anyway going forward a couple years in no leasehold forthcoming um, argument started about certain practices on the farm um, uh, 96, November of 96, we were asked to vacate the premises, which we did not do. Um, at that moment, got offered 1996 Main Street, the abutting. Actually, it had all been one farm once, and it had. So I, at that time, we, at that time, bought the abutting house barn and 18.65 and acres and um, started to, act, to to renovate the house so that it would be more habitable and it's in pretty rough shape. Still working on it. Anyway, at a certain point, I moved up to the 1996, but Rosanna stayed in um, 1860, and um, we roofed it, we insulated it, we did a lot of work on it, um, and periodically 
Rosanna was asked to leave, but no effective uh, removal happened. And uh, so, um, as I read adverse possession statute, she's clearly in the box. She has been in open, notorious, and hostile possession for well in excess of 15 years. Uh, it became an issue because I also had an adverse possession claim going to the land, um, which was part of the negotiation with the estate, was the, the, whether, whether we could achieve some settlement short of litigation about my adverse possession, and in the event we did, and I paid the money and undertook the, the liability for Rosanna's adverse possession. Is that, did that answer you, the question? It, it partly answered my question, okay. yes. Uh, uh, it's, it's been a very long time since I studied this in law school, <laughs> but my recollection is that the, uh, the other element of adverse possession is that it be under a claim of right. Do you know if that's a part of Vermont law? And that is not in the Vermont statute. Okay. Um, so it, it, it's, it's really about the fact. Uh, it, it, open, notorious, hostile, meaning that, yeah, that, it, that is explicitly without the permission of of the owner, right. or of the record owner. And this, this, this act, well, it, it does go back into English common law. Mm -hmm. And the right, yeah. ownership is a right, it's a use right. God, king, or republic, landowner. Uh, you have the responsibility to act as owner and protect, the, and to use land. That's, so that's, that's how it derives. Now, I've got another question, which is that, according, as I understand what the assessor said, that this property, just in the normal operations of the work of the assessor, this property is about to be uh, reassessed down to 199.5. And I don't quite understand how that works. But if that happens, is that something that you would be satisfied with? Um, yeah, it's it's really close to what I was thinking was an appropriate response to the the facts. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I retain and didn't write about some concerns about the valuation on 1996 and overall in the um, the much of the land that we're talking about in the joint pieces is very challenging, unbuildable, ledgy, steep, etc. But um, I decided that in the scope of things, the, the appraisal was fairer for the infrastructure on the upper portion, even though you know, the grand list, as I understand it, went up about 35% overall. Uh, 1996 doubled, uh, more than doubled in value. Um, I, you know, I, uh, it, I, I'm not, I'm not overwhelmed with feelings of joyful equity about that either, truth be told. But, but, you, but you didn't appeal 1996. Yeah, but I really was felt strongly about the, the value of the 29 and a half acres. And it sounds like by whatever magic happened. It's basically the two, um, the two acre building lot goes away. So when you, take the two, when you take the two and combine them into one, you don't have that. It's still there. You still have that two acre building lot. It's you're just taxed separately on it. So that brings the assessed value down, if that makes sense. And this, would that go back to April 1st? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. And so any whatever bills he's gotten will be we'll readjusted. readjusted. Yeah. Okay. In uh -huh. January. Any other questions that anyone has? Um, is it your testimony that the value is 199.5? Yes, it will be corrected to that through errors and omissions. Okay. And that's acceptable to you? Yeah, it kind of moots the point. I mean, 
188 is close. But you know, this is it, it, we keep missing the opportunity to make precedent about these things, which have mostly not really been. There's all very, very little case law about adverse possession in Vermont. <laughs> very little. Um, um, which I think it. I mean, I, I did some research into it, and what it's going to come down to is how um, how she initially established tenancy. That's going, to, that's going to decide whether she has uh, a right to adverse possession. Or not. And again, I'm not a, I'm not a real estate Where did that opinion lawyer. come from? Because that's not in statute. It's, it showed up when I was Googling what is. Um, came from the internet. Yeah, it's got to be true if it's on the internet. Yeah. Um, um, so, so the question anyway, really is, yeah. is, is there a dispute here? I, I think we've, you know, I mean, I guess I could yeah, hold out for 188, but. Which is a proven arm's length. Mm -hmm. John, um, does that mean you're you don't need an inspection or anything like that? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know that. That means you're not interested in an inspection that we're, of the premises that we're fine. That we're uh, uh, I, I don't. I think we didn't. Wasn't there one? Haven't well uh, yeah. the assessment. Yeah, but if you wanted to appeal the amount, then we'd send then, an inspection team out. But if you're satisfied with the amount, I was going to make a motion. Yeah, I, I don't. I, 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 it really is a, a money question, ultimately not a justice question. I think it's a, it's, we're all in this together, relatively. So yes, I, I would accept the the massage to the valuation. What Go forward and hope the city controls itself. It's spending. One ninety nine. One ninety nine five. What's the, the errors and omissions? Oh no, no, I'm sorry. Oh. Um, What's the address? 1860. 1860 in Main Street. Main Street. Okay. Because I, I feel like to dot I's and cross T's, since we're at this point, yep. we should formally waive um, inspection. inspection. So I'm going to. Uh, oh, Unless he's choosing to just drop the appeal, right? Yeah. Well, Can you just drop the outcomes. appeel? One outcome is yes. that you should vote to change okay. it to 199.5, or the other outcome is that the appeal. I understand. This is going to get fixed. Right. Right. That's good. And the statute it. says that the appellant can drop the appeal at any time. Oh, sweet. Okay. Then I'm not going to say it. Is that the easiest thing if I drop the appeal? It is. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll drop the appeal. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for coming in. This was very, very interesting to watch. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's to at least a couple of us, you know. <laughs> yeah, that was very interesting. Definitely a long, short story. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Board of Civil Authority. <laughs> and uh, it's appropriate to me, we don't. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we don't make people say if they hear the others. <laughs> Although some people do. Okay, <laughs> Okay, uh, next up we have Roger Preston, is that you? Yes. All right, great. Um, oh, he took, he took his chair, didn't he? He took his chair. Oh, okay. We, we've got chairs. Okay, you solemnly affirm subject of pains and penalties of perjury. Testimony you're about to give me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. All right. Um, next up is 45 Terrace Street. Um, it is a multi-unit property. Um, the current assessment, as established by the reappraisal contract, is four hundred eighty-seven thousand one hundred dollars. Um, the property owner did did come to the informal meetings, and um, data changes were made. Uh, no changes were made during the formal grievance period. Uh, the three-unit building is in a mid-good neighborhood. Uh, it is a home built in 18, around 1880, has three units with 2,620 square feet. Uh, the building is graded C plus as an average plus. It's a good quality construction um, and is in good condition. So it's given very little depreciation um, at 16%. Um, the, the property was measured by the, uh, the reappraisal contractor from the exterior of the property. It did not gain uh, interior access. Uh, and I believe that the first, the first round, I think that was um, there were uh, data changes to the condition made uh, in the informal, uh, in the informal meetings. Um, comparable sales 
are on the first page there. Um, the first sale is the subject itself. It was purchased in August of 2020 at a sale price of $470,000, which breaks down to $157,000 per unit. Um, and then there's four compar five comparable properties, um, three and four unit buildings. Um, they're anywhere from $120,000 to $180,000 per unit. Um, when a sale happens in Montpelier, a sale verification letter is sent to the buyer. Uh, in this case, the buyer uh, sent it back to my office and felt it was a good market uh, link, uh, arms link transaction at the time. Uh, on the next page are the equity comps. Wait, did, are you saying that the seller, the buyer said it was a... Uh, yeah. like we send a, or, you, or you did? We send a verification letter to every purchaser of real estate in, in uh, Montpelier. Mm -hmm. um, it was returned by the buyers, um, stating that they felt it was an arm's length transaction. Okay, gotcha. Um, equity comps. We have um, similar neighborhoods. Uh, these are all taken from same um, mid-good neighborhoods. They are anywhere between 148,000 to 200,000 per unit. Um, so I feel the sale of the, of the subject itself, the equity comps, um, I think this is a fair assessment at $487,100. Okay, any questions from members of the board? Rosie. So um, one of the things in the letter is disputing the number of bedrooms that you mentioned that changes were made. Those should have been addressed in the first. The, the, informal, the informal meetings that we held in May are for um, data errors, mm -hmm. and, and that should have been corrected in the first round. And was it? Um, it was, was it a bedroom issue? It was. It says three, three bedrooms. But what's the. Yeah, we have three bedrooms on the. Okay, then yeah. Because yeah. it did say five. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that impact the valuation at all? No. no. Square footage. Any other questions from members of the board before we go to the next sale? Okay, Mr. Crespin. Can I get a copy of that? Of the comparable sales that were used? Yes. Because I've never seen that. They're on the website. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so thank you, I appreciate the time. Um, I remember signing the letter, and I remember the question about was it a market sale, but I wanted to make sure everyone knew the reasons why we bought it. So it might impact the definition of a market sale. So my wife and I live next door. We own the adjacent property. It was in the middle of the pandemic. My mother-in-law lived in Virginia and we were looking for a place for her to buy. For, when did I buy it from you, Tim? 2022, 20, 2002? For 20 years, we have been talking to the neighbor about buying the adjacent property for multiple reasons. One is an investment property, but also because it has always been our belief that there is a lot in between the two properties that would add value to the ownership and the only way you can create that third lot is by owning the other two. The property was never put on the market as far as I know. We had approached our neighbor. We said, what do you want for it? She gave us a number. We said, we will buy it. I don't, I mean, do I think it was a fair price? Yes, because I paid it. Do I think it's market value? Maybe, maybe not, but our purposes for buying it were driven by getting our mother, my mother-in-law to move up here and having the ability to create a third lot and generate revenue out of that sale of that third lot. So I was willing to pay more than anyone else was to a point to have those two benefits as the adjacent landowner. So I guess that's one thing I just wanted everyone to know. Um, I haven't seen these comp sales, but I did do an analysis and found 48 other three unit apartment buildings in Montpelier on the grand list that might be 46 or 49. I did a Google, I mean, I did an Excel search as best I could. Um, I, I don't know how the comp sales are doing, but, but 
the three units in there, two are one bedrooms and one's an efficiency. So there's only a total of 10 rooms and there's really only two bedrooms. I know on an efficiency you have to believe you have to say there's a bedroom in there, so that's why there's three. So it's a 10 room, two or three bedroom unit. All of the other, the top 20 other three bed, three unit, um, three apartment building units all had anywhere from 11 to 20 rooms and all were five to nine bedrooms. So significantly more opportunity for income with multiple bedrooms. I think everyone knows that people don't rent based on square footage, they rent based on rooms and bedroom sizes. So the closest one I can find in terms of a comp is 32 Loomis Street which is a three apartment building, which seems to have similar number of bedrooms and number of rooms, and it's assessed at $473,200. So I guess I'm just asking the question of, if the unit I own has smaller number of units, smaller number of, um, small number of rooms, smaller number of bedrooms, we had different reasons why we bought it, why aren't we more in line with something that's $15,000 less assessed value than, than the place we bought? Okay, any? Can, can you say again how many bedrooms are in the unit? Well, I, legally, I guess there's three. There is a one bed, there are two units are one bedroom each, and one is an efficiency. So in your letter, you said one is a two bedroom and one is a one bedroom. One is a one bedroom with a den that could be used as a second bedroom. It's currently being used as a one bedroom. But that goes to the total number of rooms. But even at four bedrooms, it's still well below any of the other three unit apartment buildings that I looked at. In 32 Loomis, you know, they, they you're thinking is the most comparable, is the best just, comparable. Just from looking at the, I, from looking at the tax card, and it, it looked to seem that it had a similar number of rooms, a similar number of bedrooms, and and, and square footage, you know, walking distance to Montpelier, those sorts of things. And, you know, where we are, it, I can walk, but it's a. It's a steep hill coming back up. Loomis is a lot flatter getting downtown. Yeah, not everybody would make that walk. I, I yeah, got that. You know. Any other questions? If we're searching, I don't know if I can say. Something. Yeah, go ahead. If we're searching for comps that are like off by ten or fifteen thousand, it's probably going to be um, a matter of condition. So when you look at well, thirty-two Loomis, look at the condition um, versus forty-five Terrace. That's typically. That's typically where you see the differences in the condition. Um, their home is rated as very little depreciation. It's been up, it's been kept up really well. 32 Loomis may have more depreciation, so it's going to come in at a lower assessment. So that's typically where we see those kind of differences. Okay, Bob. A question for the assessor: Between uh, April of, between August of 2020 and April of 23, how much do the property values? Not assessed values, but property values and sales go up in that year and a half. It's two and a half years. It's been steep. It's been 30, 40 percent. Um, I, I still, I still see them 30, 40 percent over assessment. Some 50. You know, not, it's not on assessed value, but on correct. Okay, correct. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and, and I want to clarify, make sure I understand what you're saying when you, when you said you thought there was a lot between the two houses. There's not a separate parcel of land now, but because of the size of the, uh, of the yards, you could steal a little bit from one, a little bit from the other to create a new building lot. I was told that originally there were three lots and that the original owners split it, the third lot into split it down the middle and created two on Jordan Street. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't have facts to that, but there is definitely if so so I did go down to the city planning department a couple years ago and had a conversation and the only reason I cannot create a third lot there right now is because I have three units 
on the apartment building property and the square footage does not allow me to create a fourth unit with, I, I, would, I would have to, I would basically have to take that property down to a two unit property to create that middle lot. Or I could build, I could do a lot line adjustment and build a second structure on my primary residence, but I couldn't subdivide it out. I see. So it's a, it's a, right now it's a zoning square footage question is my understanding. Mm -hmm. But there's probably people in this room who know much better than me. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Can we look at the, I think we agree that we could look at the property cards for any property. I'd be curious to look at the property card for 32. Yeah. I can email that out um, to the board. Okay, I think the next step is to appoint the committee to go out and view the property and come, come up with a report. Any Could we ask if he wants an inspection? Well, um, I think it's the, the standard practice is there. I guess we have to do this, that. Yeah, we, should, we do, yeah. Carrie, you're, you're one? I'm volunteering for yep. the committee, yep. Bob? And Mark. Mark. Yeah, because, okay, great. Um, and do we have your contact information? Yes. You called me. Oh. Yes, I got the phone number. Oh, good. Okay, so okay. what's going to happen? Put the email to um, I probably have that too. So what's going to happen is the members of the committee will contact you to set up a, a viewing of the property. We'll look at the other uh, at the comparables, and they'll issue a, a report with their opinion, and we'll come back here and talk about, and then we'll make a decision. Okay. I do not have an email address for you. Write it down. All here. one. You got my name, right? It's yeah. the oh, whole yeah. name at gmail.com. Oh, okay. That's it. Okay. Don't forget the Dean and Roger. Okay. <laughs> well, all of you who are going to visit get both cell phone as well as email because I have a hard time getting people to respond to messages like a phone call. All right. Yeah. Great. Thanks Thank for you. coming in. All right. You're up. Um, Good evening. Liam, good to see you. It's been a while. How are you? Good. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. And, and are, are you going to have to be presenting any testimony? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you and Jesse, are you going to be testifying also? You solemnly affirm subject to the pain and penalties of per perjury. The testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Excellent. Thank you. Um, they, we're going to just do something real quick. Do you want, do you want to look for? Do you want to make an exception this time? Yeah, yeah let's, uh, let's. Yeah, I think let's an introduction might be worthwhile. First, yeah. my name is Liam Murphy. I'm an attorney in Burlington. Uh, I'm school attorneys, and uh, you know, all may know Jesse. Yeah, I know some. I know some of you. I don't know all of you. I'm Jesse Jacobs. Uh, my family and I have been uh, working in investment real estate in Montclair for some time now. So, we have actually, let me ask you, has my son done work for you? I think he has. Who is your son? Benji. You know, you and I have never met. <laughs> we haven't, but no. Ben talks about you. So I think oh, no, I'm, he's, one, he's one of my he is one of my good friends. Him and I have done a ton of work together. Yeah, I'm going to withdraw. You're going to recuse yourself from this one. Yeah. Gotcha. Just when it comes up for a vote. Okay. So, just by way of introduction, we sort of have two separate presentations to talk to you about. And I made copies of letters for all of you. You can pass them around this way and that way. Here's Stephen. And some go that way. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So this, this first letter is uh, just we're raising a procedural question, um, which is that um, simply the statute requires that the BCA um, issue a notice of hearing uh, to be held no more than 14 days 
after the last day of an appeal. Uh, so here the uh, decisions uh, of the listers were issued on uh, August 16th, which made the last day of the appeal on August 30th. Uh, by statute, they uh, would have had to uh, notice that they uh, have a hearing no later than September 14th, and um, the hearing notice uh, for the BCA did not go out <clears throat> until September 7th and um, uh, for uh, beginning on um, the 21st. So we're raising a procedural issue whether you comply with a statute. Um, John and I have had some uh, exchange of communications. Um, there uh, is uh, an argument that uh, because of uh, uh, the emergency that um, there was uh, an allowable extension of deadlines. Um, I don't think it applies because it only applies to licenses, permits, programs, and plans, and this is not one of those. And then um, there's also a question about um, municipalities extending specific deadlines for if you're over 5,000 for 50 days. And that doesn't apply to this particular uh, issue because that is really with the filing of the grand list. You'll see I, I refer to a case that just came, just 22, uh, I mean 2020, just came down from the Vermont Supreme Court, written by uh, Beth Robinson, who uh, in that case uh, says that there are some deadlines that are um, uh, suggested, uh, but not mandatory, but she specifically talks about the deadline for the BCA and the notice for the 14 days being mandatory. So, with that said, I've, I've, I've submitted this letter, certainly you can look at it and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, consult about it, but we also wanted to make our presentation as well. Well, let me just ask you one question. Yeah. I, I, I know, I, I don't think anybody wants to spend a lot of time in legal yeah. arguments here, but, but the question that occurred to me was if, you're, if you were able to find any cases that uh, define what uh, substantially complied means. No, you, uh, you, th this man is obviously a, a very competent and bright lawyer who focused right on the important issue, which is what does substantially comply mean? There, there isn't, and you know the question is, if it was a day, would that be substantial? Is seven days insubstantial? I, I did not find any any okay. case, at least in the tax context, and I and I uh, frankly didn't have time to look outside the tax context to determine what substantial compliance is. But that's why we decided that we'd also make a presentation mm -hmm. on on the values as well. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so, before we talk about your pile of individual values, um, I'm going to give you another letter to put with your... Uh, okay. So this um, is, is, is a letter outlining some background um, on the fair market value of properties. talk about that first and then we'll, uh, just in, in a generalized sense. I think there are, I think there are two, I think there are two letters. Did I, make, did I put the letters backwards? Uh, so, but, so the big picture, as you know, is in any appraisal, the issue is... Are they both They look the same. No, they're... No, they're, they're, they, they look the same, I apologize, but they are, uh, they are different letters. Okay. Um, they are, one, one addresses, yeah, one addresses the procedural issue and the other addresses in general what I want to uh, talk about. Okay. And that is, what is, what is the, uh, an, an assessment supposed to look like? It is supposed to take a snapshot as of, April 1st, the magic time saying, what on April 1st would a willing buyer 
buy a property from a willing seller, assuming that there is no um, uh, in, uh, requirement to sell or requirement to buy. So what would it be in an open marketplace? And, and I know you've dealt with a lot of um, residential properties, but when you come to commercial properties, the issue is it's an investment. And the question is, when you have uh, somebody buying a commercial property, they are looking at what are they going to buy that property for and get a return on their investment. Generally, what uh, a buyer does is look at the income and expenses, they, uh, and then they determine what rate of return they're going to get. You know, uh, if uh, a very simple example, if you were going to buy a property for $100,000 and you wanted uh, an 8% uh, uh, return on that property, you would want to have uh, a net income of, of $8,000 after you paid all your income and expenses. And that's how uh, commercial properties are, are purchased. Now, one of the issues that we deal with is it's a, it's a timing issue. It's a, an issue of what is uh, the particular time when people are investing. And you have, you know, the town obviously hires this appraisal company. They come in and they do a chart. Uh, where's that little chart? They, they have a very simple chart that they use in, um, in determining what they come up with values. And, you know, this is, came from the, them. It gives a, a value of what a studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom should be, the square footage of what banks, manufacturing office, restaurants should be. And then they give a expense ratio of what they think expenses should be. And then they multiply that by what's called a capitalization rate. A capitalization rate is the rate of return that somebody is expecting to get an investment. The issue that we have here and why there are so many properties that we're looking at is the appraisal company are coming in and looking at this in a generalized way and they're looking backwards. So last summer, 2022, when they were putting all of their work together, they're looking at properties that have sold in early 22, in 21, in 20, and they're using that material to project what a property would have sold on April 1st of 2023. I've done this for 40 years, and I represent a lot of purchasers and a lot of developers. And what I have found is, effectively, these appraisal companies are always looking backwards. They're looking at what did something sell for before versus a developer or a purchaser or an investor is going to look at what am I going to get in the future? Because what do I put my money into? And as we know, there has been an absolute sea change in properties in the last few years. In the 2021, 22, 2021 and early 22, interest rates were 3 to 4%. Bond rates were zero. Anybody who had money in a bank account or uh, in, in an investment was getting very little on that money. So what, when people invested in, in real estate at that time, they were looking at the comparable investments they could get in interest rates and in bonds, and they would add to that. Because when you buy real estate versus buying um, and getting a bond, you're taking on more risk. It's illiquid. It has subject to possibility of, of uh, uh, damage. You get maintenance. You get a lot of unexpected expenses. So traditionally, what people have looked at is the difference between um, a, a, a money market rate and, uh, and uh, investment real estate is they want 5% more because of that investment that they're making is riskier and it's illiquid. So now come to April 1st of this year. 
April 1st of this year, bonds were paying 4%, interest rates were paying 6.5%. The, there had been a sea change today, their bonds are paying 5%. So our, it, the question is, if, if you have an investor as of April 1st looking at uh, a, a building in Montpelier that's an apartment building or a mixed apartment office building or a mixed apartment restaurant building, what are they going to pay in terms of getting a rate of return from their money when they can be looking at a market where they can get 4% for guaranteed investment and no profit. They're going to pay a lot less. They're going to want an investment return higher. So in this case, what the, um, what the appraisal company did, they used as a cap rate, a rate of return, um, ranging uh, uh, a number between 6.29% uh, for apartments and 7.79% 7 uh, for a mixed uh, a restaurant and an apartment building because those are more risky. Right? So we believe that those rates that they did, that multiplier that they did, was much too low by April 1st, 2023. And that doesn't even take into account something that is the elephant in the room, which was that as anybody investing in Montpelier in April of 2023 would have known that in the last 50 years there have been in these downtown properties two flooded properties. And the additional risk of that, they would take into account. Now, next April 1st, the amount of risk that somebody will take into account will obviously be much higher because now there's been a third one and a much more severe one. So what we've done is we've tried to do a couple of things to try to make this more realistic. And that is first, instead of projecting for the um, projected incomes based upon a chart, we're gonna, we looked at the, ex the exact income that each property got for the last three years and averaged it. We then, and if there were vacancies, we projected what those vacancies should get because there are some vacancies and those will be explained. And then we put in the real expenses of the property. And then that comes up with a, uh, a, a net income. And then we propose a, a very conservative but slightly higher cap rate of 7.75 for apartments, 8% for mixed office and apartments, and 8.25% for um, uh, uh, a mixed office and restaurants. So those multipliers then came up with a different number. But to be conservative, we then put, took, we took those numbers, took the, our income and expense uh, and multiplying by what the appraiser had put in this uh, 6.19 to 7.75, and came up with a value, did ours with our 7.75, came up with a value, and then we averaged them to be conservative. So I'm going to give you some charts now, and sorry, but we need to give you some background of how we're trying to approach these properties because. They're important properties. They are all properties that are um, uh, uh, commercial and investment properties. And um, so what we've done is uh, put all of the uh, income and expenses on uh, this chart and then use our multipliers. And we will be glad to share the actual income and expenses for every property with the assessor so that they can confirm. But we're asking them, obviously, to be confidential. Any of the materials we're giving you now is public, and we, you know, we just don't want all of the details to be available. So we'll, we'll pass that on. So with that, I'm going to let Jesse, we can then proceed property by property to discuss them. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. That's what I'm going to say.
Yeah, we typically do hear from Marty. Marty suggested that it would be okay. make sense to get the overview from Liam because this is a different. Uh, I'm sure they made 20 votes. I think they so. when they come around to it. Yeah. So the next two copies Yes. We need one more up here from John. I thought I made 20 copies, so hopefully we'll get so, yeah, proceed on property by property, however you want. Um, so we, the, the order we have them in is the order that I'm going to go in. And the first one we have is 15 Berry Street. You want to flip to that? So the way, that we, um, the way the city comes to the um, reappraisal contractor came up with values is we did send out information to all commercial and apartment owners to get expenses. Um, so the expenses that we have on these properties are derived from actual um, income and expense uh, requests. Uh, 15 Berry Street, we've comped it out to Four other, four other similar properties. Um, we're breaking it down per square foot on that first page at $121 per square foot um, of the assessed value. And that's falling right in line with the first, um, it's with, the, with, the, with the four comps of State Street, Langdon, Main, and, and another one on Berry Street. Uh, these are all um, similar properties that have sold within that um, April 20 to April 23 timeframe. Um, 100 Main Street is probably most similar because it's a mixed res residential and restaurant use, similar to Berry Street. Um, on the second page, there's some general income approach information, um, which is very generalized until you get down to the, um, the subject property itself, the income, the vacancy, the expenses. Um, that gives you a, a value of 583000 versus the assessment of 568,500. Um, and again, the equity comps on the next on the next page. The you know the subject at 15 Berry Street at 121 dollars a square foot falls well within the range of um, these five other properties, six other properties, five other properties, I should say. Um, so it appears that this one, in the opinion of the assessor, seems to be fairly assessed at $568,500. Um, we should probably open each one of them up to questions so we don't blast right through them too fast. Mm -hmm. Rosie. So, Marty, I see you listed capital abatement of 9.5 here, which is higher than the assessed value of 568000 what the appellant is saying that we're using. These are cap rates that were generated from actual income and expense from all property owners that um, submitted information back in uh, March when we requested it. So these are all these are these are. Is that specific to this property, or is this like, an average? This is going to be typical, uh, typical numbers between nine and a half and ten percent. Yeah, I mean, um, to be fair, the the appraise, uh, the assessment company, the appraisal company. When it does a capitalization rate, it does, excludes taxes from the expenses, so that the, then the obviously then the expenses are lower, and so what what typically happens in these is the reason they do that is because at the year that they're doing the appraisal, the tax rate is going to change, and they make an assumption. So well, our, ta our, our charts reflect taking off the 221, 2.21, yeah. 2 which ended up being your tax rate uh, for this year to reduce the, um, uh, to, to, to take out the taxes. Okay. okay. So, so when they put nine percent, we say that that's actually a six point eight, six point nine percent cap rate. 
2.21, which is your tax, new tax rate. Are taxes allowed in? Remember the discussion from last week. Yeah. Are taxes counted? Is not taxes? Not typically. Well, then uh, you know you can. If you don't count the taxes, you have a higher cap rate. We just put the lower. We clear the taxes and then put a lower capitalization rate to reflect that. It's the same thing. You can, it's either nine percent including taxes or six point. Seven nine percent without taxes, uh, it, it ends up being the same uh, uh, effect. And then your number should be the same as ours, then. Yeah. If we no, no, no. If we were in agreement about the, the cap rates, yes. if we were, if, if, well, you said if we were one or the other, so no, no. And in, in when we in the column that we put in here, uh, where we put in the lower cap rate, we just assume it's two point. To one percent less. Right. So, in uh, actually, if everybody has, uh, everyone has a copy of the, the spreadsheet with the, all of the properties on it. The um, the city assessor capper. It's uh, column one, two, three, four, five. It's column six here. Um, if you are to add in the tax rate for this year, two point two one, that will equalize to the to the rate that. Marty is is talking about. I'm where I was looking at uh, Marty's summary. Right. Right. So, one of the taxes on this property, average taxes. Uh, 15 taxes. 568. Proposed tax 12661. No, 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 the taxes. No. Just the ta average taxes. Yeah. For the, for the average taxes for, the, for this property. And then this oh, okay. It's 15 Barry. 15 Barry Street. What was the taxes you paid last year? I don't know. Uh, 11,545. Right. So the explanation is if you look on page 2, they have admitted about 55,000 to be 84. But then that doesn't include payment of taxes of 11,545. 11, right. So if you were to, if, you, if, if we were to leave the taxes in, then the 9.5% um, is, is fine because your net income is more. What we did is, Take the, uh, the the taxes out as an expense, which means that um, you know, it's forty four thousand, but you reduce the the capitalization rate by two point two one percent, and and the multiplier it effectively will, will will end up being the same. It's it's just a, a matter of how you approach the the taxes. I think the, an important thing to say is uh, as, as when somebody is looking to purchase property, they look at the taxes as an expense, which is why we are looking at the capitalization rates with the taxes included as an expense. We, we have put, built the tax rate back in to the capitalization rate to account for how the methodology of the assessor is working here. Are we... We're confusing everyone. No, I get it. So, so, so the, you know, it's, it's important to understand what how uh, the capitalization works. If you were to buy this, look at this property at fifty-five thousand dollars, what the question is is what would you spend on the property in order to get a nine and a half percent return? to get $55,000 in your pocket. That's how they did the calculation. And that's how they come up with, you know, if you want to do the math, that's how they come up with $568,000. Because if you bought something for $568,000 and you 
you got a nine and a half percent return on that that money, you would end up putting fifty five thousand three eighty four in your pocket. The problem with that calculation is that you wouldn't have then you'd pay your taxes of eleven thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And then you'd have forty four thousand in your pocket. All we said was fine, what would it cost to get a seven point or six, well, I'm doing my math wrong here. Six, six point seven nine. Seven point seven nine, I think you yeah. said. Two, or no, six point seven nine. Two, two point two one off of nine point five is yeah seven point two nine, right? All we said is if I bought a property and I wanted a seven point two nine percent and I paid all my taxes, then I would have to buy it at the same amount, five hundred. $768,000, but that, that's using their calculations. So the calculations end up being the same amount. It's just, you know, uh, what all we said is, you're going to count, somebody's going to calculate their, the money that goes into their pocket after they pay their taxes, not, not to before they pay their taxes. So you have a higher rate, but then you're going to pay the, the, the taxes later. So. That, that's how we got there. We probably, you know, they end up being near to the same number if 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 we agreed with the numbers. But the the, the real issue here is the actual net income of these properties if, is what. Uh, at the average net income of 15 Barry Street over uh, 2020, 2021, and 2022 is, is 30,000. Nine hundred seventy-eight dollars and seventeen cents. Right, right in the chart. Right. Right. So we're saying they they projected fifty-five thousand, not including taxes. But if you took off the taxes, forty-four thousand. So they're these are they're not projecting projected, they're not projected numbers, but actual numbers that were given to us. Uh, well, we don't we don't know where they came from. Right, I know. Where they came from. Well, the testimony is that it, it was based on an information request from the assessor to uh, the property owner and the property owner report that and the property owner reported certain numbers and that's what this is okay let, let maybe let's let's have a discussion about what goes into those expense numbers because that may be obviously the difference is and, and we'll, we'll share this with the assessors. Well, I have so, a couple of, I've seen a couple of questions. Yeah. Bob, you had your hand up. Are you set now or not? Well, we, we keep on hearing yeah. the different approach and by the end yeah. of the came out 583, so I don't know where you use the income approach. They came up with 583,000. Uh -huh. They didn't accept that if they use <coughs> The other method, which was comparable sales. And Judy, you had a question yeah, just, too. To, just to help me remember, isn't this similar to something we've had in the past where what they're saying is expenses and what the assessor counts as reasonable expenses aren't the same? So that, excuse me, that was an Act 78 question. Oh. And they were trying to, uh, um, they were using various un. Accounted for oh, expenses okay. different than real estate. No, but that, that is the question I was about to, to answer, which was so there, there were assumptions. They they used a, a, a generalized 3% vacant, 5% vacancy. We used a generalized 3% vacancy. They We include uh, an 8% management fee and a 3%? 2.75%. 2 2.75%. Capital reserve, um, and those may be the differences that result in a different calculation. But again, what we try to do in our calculations is what any person who is investing in commercial real estate would they would look at the income expenses for the last three years, they would put in um, the actual expenses, they would put in their vacancies, they project what they might get from that. If there were some upside potential in the property, they would put that in and then they do a calculation rate and then they buy the, the property uh, based upon that. And that's what we're trying to 
um, state and all of these that, that we're very consistent in each case of putting in um, a management fee, uh, vacancy rate, and a, uh, a capital reserve all at those. All at There's those also levels. two other approaches to value too. What is it worth in the open market and what is the assessment as far as equity? You know, when you're doing citywide reappraisals, it has to be um, the three-pronged test is, um, is the data accurate? Um, does it reflect market value, which includes income, of course, and is it fairly assessed when compared to similar properties? So, and that's that's what these the breakdown of each one of these will show where they fall in line as far as that goes. And Don, I think you have a question. I just go back to numbers. And so, I really wanted to understand when you went to the grievance meeting, was there any clarity of each party listing what they considered expenses and income? Uh, all that information was collected in March, and it was all, I mean, I don't think the, the income and expense wasn't an issue at the time. But they're using that as a big basis now, so this mm -hmm. is like new information. The, yeah, that's, okay. this is kind of new to me. Well, we, 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 there was a, because, the, as you know, the appeal period uh, that started in this started the, the week of the floods. And well, let's let's address that first. Well, no, let's address that. I was just going to say that then um, the hearings were put off, and we thought we would. Uh, there was a miscommunication about it when when the hearings would be, and we apparently didn't request a hearing, and we thought we were going to get a notice. So there wasn't a hearing at the. Uh, uh, grievance at the listers just because there was a miscommunication of how, um, uh, of when that would be. Otherwise, we would have presented all this information at, at that time. So after the flood, um, we were right in the middle of the second week of grievance. Um, I, I contacted Carl Andier, who was a staff attorney at the LCT, um, and he sent to me during a state of emergency declared under this chapter, municipal corporation may extend any statutory deadline applicable to municipal corporations. So we were well within our right to extend. Um, I also think it's the humane thing to do when people are trying to shovel out their basements of mud to extend two weeks. Um, we met every statutory deadline. Um, notices went out as they were required to. They went out, um, as a matter of fact, you guys came to the, the formal grievance. Um, we still met the September 14th deadline to file the grand list. We have not missed a deadline, and we were well um, advised by the LCT and the city's um, staff attorney that we were um, well within our right to extend the grievance period. Oh, we had no dispute with that. I'm just saying I had a miscommunication that. about the when, when the hearing would be, and that's why we didn't. We that the was, everybody else got them. Okay, I, I don't, have to, I don't just, understand the taxpayer to say that he did. We did something wrong. I think he's no, just no, trying no. to answer Donna's question, which is why no. are we coming? Why are we faced with these numbers now? When that's the kind of thing that we might have expected it to be mm -hmm. thrashed out at the grievance. Process. Is that no, right? I, I mean, you know, I, I I just looked at the email today. I wrote you on August 16th saying, "Hey, when are we having the hearing?" And you wrote back, "You missed it, and we're issuing the decisions today." And that was my, you know, I hadn't checked in. I'm not blaming this, that, that at all. It just there was a miscommunication. I thought we, I, I would get a notice, and we didn't. And that, and that's just why we didn't. But on your side or our part? My part. Oh, okay. my part. I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm not blaming the city at all on that. I'm just saying it didn't happen because. There was, a, I, 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 there was a miscommunication. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Bob. Question for Marty. We see two approaches here, an income approach and a comparable sales approach. Right. Is there requirements to weigh one or the other? Or which? It seems like all your uh, assessments come out to the comparable sales approach, if I... We're going to find there's two properties in there that I think were over-assessed, and that's going to be based on um, the equity comps. Um, so if they, if they all fall in line, then there's no precedence to, to rely on one or the other. Um, but at the end of the day, it has to be equitable. Everyone has to be treated fairly. So I tend to lean more towards the equity, the equity comparisons. Okay. May I just comment? But the, the 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 assessors didn't do that. They based upon 
uh, not on comparables, but on that's projected three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. On this, they projected the income, gave it a cap rate, and multiplied that out. We're, I mean, oh, oh, and we're we'll giving you the information. We think that the the expenses, the net income, was a lot less than the um, that they that they that they had netted, and if heard ad nauseum that we think the cap rate was uh, too high. And if I can uh, be clear, I, well, I haven't had to re I had a chance to read your thing yet, but. Would you say that for, for each one of these appeals, the difference between where you are and where the assessment is, assessor is comes down to um, vacancy and management uh, as expenses? Or are there other factors for some of the properties? Well, I mean, I, I think the answer to, I'm not entirely sure uh, what the expenses are that the, as the assessor is using specifically here. Um, I know that all of our, uh, all of these expenses um, have been averaged over the, the last three years, and that's where we came up with the net income figures that we are using uh, on the spreadsheet that we passed out to everyone here. And, that, that, and in order to get to uh, those values, we took that net income and multiplied it by the capitalization rate that we believe to be equitable. And, um, and it's, so it's your testimony that, that you would offer this chart as an exhibit as accurately reflecting each of the figures in here, including your expenses and... This, oh, this, this chart is fine. Yeah. What you have, yes. Okay. Um, 96 Berry Street. Uh, we appraised the company to set a value of 674,900. Um, it's another multi multi unit building with seven residential units. It's 6,305 square feet total. Um, with these, the importance is, uh, like I said before, is going to be condition. Um, this building is graded as C plus, being a good. Uh, I'm sorry, an average plus uh, for quality. It's in average condition. Um, there is a detached little cottage which is rated as fair. Um, so it's not giving uh, a great value. It is comped out to six, um, six sales of larger buildings. And they are selling between 91,000 and 200,000 per unit. Um, that three to five Cedar Street is a very nice building. So that's, um, it just gives you the really ceiling of the, of, um, of the per unit value. Um, is that the new one? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so the this, this subject being assessed at 96,000 per unit falls in line with the um, 98, 137, 92, and 91. Um, again, the income that was provided is on the second page for the income approach. Um, the income approach on this one, um, Bob was asking earlier about the, um, the differences in values. This one um, indicates a much lower value of 607 by the income approach, um, and I believe that it could be rented below market. Um, the equity comps all fall in line um, with similar properties. Um, when comparing something this size, um, we want to use buildings of more than, more than four units, um, as these tend to fall into commercial, uh, commercial territory. So the assessment of 96,000 per unit on this one uh, falls right falls in line with with the um, equity comps, anywhere between 95 and 125,000. So the assessment of 674 as far as equity, um, it falls in line. As far as sales, it falls right in line. The income approach may be something you want to consider as the um, as the board. 
Um, and attached are the, of course, are the record cards for the two buildings. There are uh, two separate buildings on this property. Um, it gives the condition ratings for the buildings. Any questions on that one? Um, not for me. Okay. Guys, sure. Uh, 104 Berry Street. It's another building with seven units. Um, it's going to have similar comps. The, the um, reappraised contractor set of an initial value of $514,200. Um, it's a, these are all considered traffic average neighborhoods. Barry, Barry Street's a busy, busy street. When compared to sales, this one breaks down to $74,400 per unit, which is well under the range of um, other comparable sales of larger buildings. Um, again, that's that Cedar Street that's in there just because it was a recent sale. Um, I would tend to discount that one. In income approach on this one indicates a little bit higher value, $527,300 versus the assessment of $514,200. When comparing equity, um, the, per unit, the per unit value on it's well under um, neighboring properties on Berry Street at 73,400 uh, 73, per unit. So it appears that this one is um, equitably assessed at 514.2. Uh, yeah, yeah, Do we know the condition of these other buildings? That you can... These are all selected because they're similar condition. Okay. Yeah. Same neighborhood, same condition. Value seems, is it lower because there's so many units, or is it just? Yeah, usually, uh, you know, scale of economy. Like the more, uh, the more units you have, the, the lower per, you know, per unit, per unit price. Any questions? Per unit value taking into account size of the units at all? Size, no. And, and Marty, one of the things I, yeah. You, you did testify earlier that the city or the contractor wrote to all the commercial property owners asking them for their uh, income and expenses, but for, but for a couple of these, like uh, the last one, 96 to 98 Barry Street, and this one, your report specifically says that the owner did not provide actual income exp and expense information. That would be a type of rough flare, I apologize. For oh, so, so in all these things where it says the owner did not provide actual, that, that's um, wrong and they actually did? Mr. Jacobs did, pr did provide income and expense, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on that one specifically? Yeah, we. I, I just want to note for the record on uh, this, the uh, taxes last year were 77.60, and um, our on our chart, our actual income and expenses are 35. Um, and is this? 27, 27. Yeah, 27, 377. That's the average over three years. Okay. Good there. Um, the next one I have is 28 Main Street. Um, we appraise the contract to set an initial value of $636,100. Um, an adjustment was made during the um, informal meetings. Uh, it lowered the value to $558,700. Issue there was parking, uh, an adjustment was made to parking. 
Um, this is a, a graded C average quality and fair condition with high depreciation of 58%, which is going to be reflected in the uh, per square foot price. Um, we have that as $98 per square foot in assessed value. Uh, like I said, that's due to the high depreciation of it. So when compared to um, the four sales, it's well, well below the um, sale, the, the current sale price. Income approach on this one indicates a, sale, um, a value of six eighty nine nine hundred. The assessment is five fifty eight seven hundred. So that's well within acceptable range there as far, as far as income goes. Equity comps. Uh, like I said, the uh, price, the uh, assessed value per square foot is pretty low to, due to the high depreciation. So that's um, well under uh, comparable properties on, uh, on State and Main Street. So with this one, it appears to be equitably assessed at 558700 I see this one on your chart. It's the third property. Just under the 28? 28. 28. Yeah. They listed as 28, and Stan listed as 28 to 30. So looking at this picture on the back, is it is it just this? Correct. OK. Yep. Oh, it's just the white building. Is that what you're Yeah. 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 Everybody was looking at the picture. It's just the white. Any questions on that one? Can I make some notes? There, there are some significant, there's a significant difference between the our income and um, net income on that property and what uh, yes. the assessor has as, as an income here. Um, it's huge. It's huge. Uh, in, uh, in 2019, and I think you all have the notes uh, here, we, uh, the state got in touch with us about updating their files regarding uh, a petroleum cleanup, some petroleum cleanup work that was done back in the 80s there, a tank that was out back and was removed. Um, when they came through, uh, it should have been covered by the Petroleum Cleanup Act, but when they came through to uh, to do the work, they found that there were um, there were some dry cleaning solvents on site there, uh, which the petroleum cleanup fund does does not cover the, the removal of. And so, uh, we've been working through kind of various mitigation plans with different environmental agencies to the point of actual uh, removal of the um, compromised soils in the alleyway there, but been a significant expense over the course of um, the last three years at this point. We believe we've gotten, we've gotten everything completed, but the site remains um, uh, under state supervision for the time being. We have, to do, uh, we have to do continual testing until they decide that we are worthy of a smack letter there. And um, is, is, the, is the alley part of this parcel? It, it's a... Uh, it's kind of split between the two buildings uh -huh. there. Uh, and because it was dry cleaning solvents at some point in history, that building was a dry cleaner, not the other one. Mm -hmm. So the expenses wouldn't have the mitigation in, in here? So we removed $65,000 expenses over the last three years from our expenses, but we left in $5,000 a year for monitoring uh, costs, which is okay. what we're expecting will go forward. Right. So, um, uh, and, and obviously it's a contaminated property, which will make it more difficult for anybody to buy. We good on that one? Um, 54 Main Street. We had an originally, um, the contractor set a, um, a value of 836. Uh, during the informal meeting, assessment changes were made, lowering the value to 777,700. Um, again, I believe this was a uh, parking issue. Uh, 
Uh, this is a three-story brick building built around 1900, eight residential units, one retail and one restaurant unit, 8,426 square feet, uh, which breaks down to $92 a square foot versus the assessment. Um, again, it's comped out to uh, four other similar properties. They are all selling from 119 to 161 dollars a square foot. Um, these are all commercial properties that we're comparing them to. Um, this is another building that has a uh, relatively high depreciation to it, which is going to be reflected in the, in the uh, per square foot value. Income approach. Um, the income approach, as, as reported by the contractor, indicates a value of $957,700. Uh, property is assessed, like I said, at 777700 Equity comparisons. Um, again, it's compared, we're comparing it to uh, other similar properties, other similar uh, commercial properties in the, in the uh, downtown area. Their assessments are between $108 a square foot to $220. Uh, the subject property is at $92 per square foot. Uh, and again, it appears that it is equitably assessed at $777,700. Yes? I'm sorry, which is what's the lowest? And all three of the the comps is the lowest per square foot of the all ones that compared to mm -hmm. the income approach. Uh, the income approach is much higher than the assessment. Correct. And on the equity approach, it's by far the lowest per square foot. It is because of the uh, depreciation, which you'll, you'll see right in the front. The front page is a relatively high depreciation for the appraisal contractor getting a 58%. Um, the higher the, the higher the depreciation, the lower the value is going to be at the building. Do so you apply that after all of these other factors? That's 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 all um, figured right into the um, per square foot value of the buildings. Did I lose someone? Did I lose you on that at all? Okay. I think I understand. Okay. Yeah. You, just for the record, uh, taxes last year were seventeen thousand uh, dollars, and um, our uh, average net income for the last three years is approximately forty-seven thousand uh, dollars. It was a substantial difference between what um, the uh, is down here is ninety-five thousand dollars. Well, minus that seventeen would be seventy-eight thousand. So, but you're using you're using average numbers, not actual. I, no, no, average of three years. Okay. Twenty-two, twenty. Yeah. Okay. Because we're using actual numbers that were submitted in March, from what I understand. Um, next one is one thirty-nine Main Street. Um, again, the, the reappraisal contractor set an initial value of eight seventy eight five hundred. During the informal process, um, they lowered the assessment to seven twenty five one hundred. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Can we go back just to that? Just, just, 50, just a fifty four Main Street. There's a, a gross income of one hundred and sixty thousand and nine dollars. Correct. Yeah. Is that just uh, doesn't agree with your? Well, the, the, for one year, the actual last year was one ten. One ten. One ten. Okay. Eight ninety eight. So we 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 got a little confused where some of these numbers came from. So okay. we don't know. I mean, that's that's why we think that they were using their chart to project um, income, not using actual. But obviously, they're not here to tell us. Yeah, and I was told that these were all actual. As reported by the taxpayer. We'll, yeah. we'll be glad, as I said, we'll give you sure. the income and expenses for everything, for every property, 
I think that's you, something you, they'll have to get the board because from here it's their decisions. I believe. Well, I, the, the problem is the confidentiality. Yeah, right? of course. I mean, it, and I believe that there's a, a mechanism. I, I done it with every other town to give the give it to the assessor to review, and then the assessor can verify to the board that the representations were accurate. Uh, obviously, the, the, all of this can be public record, mm -hmm. but we don't want you know every single detail of every of property to be floating around in the public record. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else? Um, so 139 Main Street. Um, Reappraise the contract for set of value of 878500 uh, During the informal meetings, an assessment change was made, lowering the value to $725,100. What's that? Oh, this, one have, this one may have been another condition issue. Um, yeah, that would not be parking. This is the funeral parlor right. on Main Street, and there's a lot of parking in the back. <laughs> there is. This one I went with um, with Jesse to look at and made a um, condition adjustment on it because <laughs> the interior condition of it. It's kind of rough. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is why we've given it a fair condition rating. Um, again, a step high depreciation of 58%. So that's going to give us a um, per square foot value of $101 per square foot. Um, when comped out to these four to these four sales, they are selling at a much higher per square foot value because they're in better condition. Um, so they're being treated fairly as far as the sale the sale approach goes. Uh, this one I don't believe is going to be the income on. No, zero. Yeah, there'll be no income because it's, I think there's an apartment or something. But, um, as far as equity comparisons, uh, the $101 per square foot of assessed value um, falls well within, under the range of $108 to $220 per square foot. Um, so this one appears to be equitably assessed at $725,100. Questions about that one? I'm not seeing any. Are you, are you set on that one? Or? No, we didn't. Okay. A couple comments. The, the comparables, and I may have missed this earlier, and all of these are. To other assessments, that, that's that's not necessarily fair market value. Um, uh, you know, this is uh, yes, this is a big parcel, but the primary income of this parcel is the parking. Uh, there's not that much rent from this. It did flood. Right? It did flood. You know, it's 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 a it's a property that is potentially redevelopable, uh, but you know. Uh, last year, the taxes were, you know, sixteen thousand six hundred and fifty dollars. So, you know, even if it's a property that is being held for redevelopment, they, the cost of holding it until that time could happen is um, uh, uh, very expensive. And uh, you know, the uh, uh, you know, we think that it's. Uh, it, it's well over value given of what it is. I mean, the first floor is basically a warehouse. And um, I, I want to make sure I understand one of the things you said, which was that I thought you said that the comparables on this uh, property were based on assessments, not sales. But well, isn't that what that column says? I can explain this for you. Oh. Excuse me. So the first the first page is going to be comparing it to sold properties, mm -hmm. right? And then on the third page, we want to make sure that no one's being overly assessed. So we compare the assessment of the subject to similar properties to make sure that their assessment falls in line with with what we feel are comparable. 
Fair enough. Does that make sense? Let's and that's the case in every one of the yes. equity. Every one of the yep. Okay, yeah. thanks. Sorry, I, I shouldn't explain that better. Sorry. So the, the first set is going to be sales, and the second set are going to be equity comps. Mm -hmm. Assessments. Uh, can I uh, a question? And you would obviously know the answer to this. The 144 Main Street sale that was across the street, was that after April 1? No, everything is as of April 1 or, or sooner. Right, no, I'm, I was asking if that property across the street sold after oh, April it, 1. Oh, the one that, uh, with three penny? No, no, no. Yeah, I think Pat Malone bought it. Yeah, 140 man. That was after. Yeah, that was after April one. That was after April. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. how significant was it after April one? Was it just? I mean, month two. Yeah, that's the cutoff. Yeah. Month yeah. two, three, right? Because I'm going to think so for six seventy five. Okay. So, well, just note that for the record. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Are we set with that one with? 139 main? Uh, I get uh, it. Seem, yeah. It seems worth just saying sure. uh, our in, our average income and uh, and expenses, um, it, inclusive of uh, an additional uh, $42,000 that I, I built back in here just for value in the building as warehouse space for my management company, which unfortunately got flooded out, lost everything. It's a real pain in the butt. Um, is uh, has been included back into uh, the net income here as far as averages, and uh, that we have that building over the over 2020, 2021, and 2022 uh, with a, a net income of uh, thirty eight thousand nine hundred ninety dollars and sixty six cents. And I, I know the main issue, obviously, with these income properties is are they making money? But there's also, you know, you got to consider the value of, to sell it. You know, what is the sales approach worth? Mm -hmm. What is it worth when compared to others? You know, so we're trying to look at it holistically from all three, you know, points of view. Okay, are you ready to move to the next one? Well, I, um, or, or do you have something to no, say? I'll, I'll comment at the end. Okay. Well, I want to um, make sure that you have every opportunity. To no, I appreciate sure. that. Uh, five to seven State Street. Uh, reappraise the contract for set an initial value of six hundred and fifty-two thousand nine hundred dollars. Uh, an adjustment was made in the informal uh, in the informal meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, the property is a brick building built around nineteen hundred with four residential units, two retail units, with a total of fifty-two hundred and thirty-six square feet. Mm -hmm. The building is uh, given a C plus, which is an average plus quality. It is an average condition. Total depreciation is about 50%. Uh, again, it's going to be reflected in the uh, per square foot um, of assessed value price of $116. And again, that's comped out to four similar properties on State and Main Street. Uh, they are selling in the range of $119 to $161 per square foot. Subject is assessed at $116 a square foot. Income approach on this one indicates a value of $645,500. Um, again, the assessment is $605,100. Equity comparisons. Um, the similar properties per square foot of assessed value are in the one hundred eight to two hundred twenty dollars range. The subject is assessed at one hundred sixteen dollars per square foot. So this one appears that it's equitably assessed as well. And um, the actual income last year was 87 to 34. We don't know where they came up with 107,000. Taxes were 12,800. 
So, you know, the real, our real net income of about almost $40,000, it's $39,900 or something, is um, a, a much more accurate reflection of the income of the property than uh, they projected. So that would probably bring you closer to the 605100 where it's assessed at. No. We'll have to look at it. Good there. <clears throat> uh, 41 State Street. Uh, we appraise the contractor set a value of 1.351100. Um, again, changes were made in the informal meeting. <coughs> uh, it's a brick building built around 1874 with two residential units, one office unit, one retail unit, and one restaurant with a total of 12,566 square feet. The building is rated as being a C plus or an average plus for quality. It is an average plus condition. Uh, this one's given a little less depreciation than the rest at 43%. <clears throat> the assessment versus size breaks down to $99 per square foot. 100 um, Main Street is probably the most similar uh, in that it is, uh, has a, a residential and uh, restaurant use to it. Um, again, that falls well below typical for sales. Uh, income again on this one? There's no residential in 100 pins. I believe there's someone from the second floor. No, there, there isn't. Um, no, it's on the offices on the second floor. Um, income on this one? As reported by the contractor. Um, gives it a value of 1.335400, a little over the current assessed value. Um, equity comps, again, at $99 a square foot for the subject, um, falls well below the um, uh, comparable properties of between 108 and $220 per square foot. Uh, so again, this one appears to be equitably assessed at 1.241900. Uh, again, the actual income for last year was 114,000 approximately. We have no idea where they came up with 223,000. In addition, pardon me? No, no, we're just talking about last year. And, and we have an average uh, uh, that the income versus just the net expenses again. Um, and uh, this property has had a restaurant vacancy for five years, which comprises us 20% of the building. Um, and when we did our calculations, we did um, actually project a rent for that restaurant because um, it is going to be, uh, uh, finally it's being rented and there is a projected uh, rent that we did include. Uh, but, um, you know, again, the, I, I, the only way they could have gotten to this 223 gross income is by making some projections based upon, uh, and, and not on the data that we, that we provided. So. Any other questions on that one? I guess it, I guess it does seem important to say that the, the, the average net income at uh, 41, 45 State Street uh, adjusted to in, include the rental of that restaurant, though with a vacancy factor that was turned up to 10% because 20% of the building was not rented for five years. Uh, that number is seventy-five thousand one hundred sixty dollars and forty-six cents. One 
why wasn't it printed? Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was COVID. You know, the folks from Asiana House moved out 2018. Um, I had a couple people, you know, kicking the tires on it, and then it was COVID. And uh, it took until now before somebody wanted to, you know, take a risk. I'm, happy, I'm very happy to have it rented. Yeah. This isn't wood, but I'm knocking. Uh, next one is 58 State Street. Um, this is one I think is, um, I think is assessed a little bit high. Their reappraisal contract was set a value of 974200 uh, It is a two-story building built around 1900 Graded average plus or C plus. Is in average and good condition with um, light depreciation at 36%. Yeah, the per square foot assessment on this one is $175, so it falls a little above the comparables that we used. Um, again, the income approach on this one. Indicates a value lower than the property assessment of 894,800. Equity comparisons. Um, like I said earlier, we're at $175 per square foot at the assessed value of 974,200. The equity comps would indicate a value closer to $160 a square foot or $890,000 uh, total assessment. Do you have any questions on that one? Perfect. Yeah, come. Questions on that one? Yeah, go ahead, Bob. You, you have a comment on this conclusion? Mm -hmm. Does that mean you're that you want to lower it down? That's my opinion, your is that it should, is it, it should be uh, closer to 890. Yes. And why did you come up with that conclusion? Based on, so the if you look at the comparable sales on the first page at $175, it's, it's higher than what they're selling for. Uh, the better comparisons are at 160 to $161 per square foot. Uh, same with the assessment, you know, as far as the equity comps go. Um, the equity comparison on the per square foot of assessed value is, is higher than what the equity comps are. There. Do you have any comments about this one? Um, I, I guess just to get the record going, that you know taxes last year were uh, seventeen thousand four hundred sixty-one dollars. Um, uh, the the gross income here is not far off what we have to record. You said the gross income is not far it's, off. It's not far off what okay. uh, the record is, but uh, the um, Expenses are obviously um, uh, a, a lot uh, different. We have them as about 51,000 net income, including taxes, uh, including the deduction for taxes. Okay. Yes. Any questions before we move to the next one? Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is 49 Greenwood Terrace. Reappraisal contractor set an initial value of $1.773 million. A lot of changes were made. Um, I, I think it was a condition. I think it was a condition issue that they, they changed uh, the value and lowered it to $1.688700. Uh, this is a big building built in 1946 with 24 units, a total of 15,000 square feet. 
The building is graded C plus or an average plus, which is a good quality. It is an average condition. Um, depreciation with this one's pretty typical, 38%. When comping this one out, um, we comp it out at a um, per unit value of $70,000 for the subject when comparing it to the assessed value. Comparable sales are in the 91 to 137,500 per unit range. Again, I wouldn't put much credence in three to five Cedar Street. Um, so when comparing it to other sales, um, it's, it's well under the um, current market value. Income approach on this one, as reported by the contractor, would indicate a value of 1.758,100. Uh, slightly higher than what the, the property assessment is at 1.688,700. Um, again, with the equity comps, um, we have other large buildings with multiple units in them. They're assessed anywhere between 95,000 and 125,000 per unit. Uh, the subject is well under that at 70,000 per unit. Uh, so I believe this one is fairly equitably assessed at 1.688,700. Um, yes. This one, you have again the owner did not provide actual expenses. Again, it's, yeah. Yeah, 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 they should be scratched on all of them. Okay, okay Leo. Uh, just for the record, the actual income last year was uh, $34,000, uh, $36,000 less than so two. 33. The taxes were uh, 23, 243, and you know you put that together. That's uh, 36 and 23 is uh, 50, um, 59, and and therefore that puts the the, the net income that we're showing at, at 101 as probably the uh, difference between those two. So. And this pro this property has uh, one or two parking space for each, spaces for each apartment, right? Uh, it has two parking spaces for each of the two bedrooms there. So it's uh, 16, and then there are uh, eight parking spaces for <coughs> each of the one bedrooms. So 24 okay. spaces. Okay, yeah. thanks. Similar question on how Marty, how did they value parking? Parking is measured, the, um, the parking lot is measured and accounted for on the, the record card. If there is no parking, there is a there is an adjustment made on, on the record cards that are provided to you. Um, we were talking earlier about one of them on I think it was on Main Street. There was a lack of parking adjustment made, which brings the value down. So there's no adjustment when there's parking, it's just built Correct. in? There's a, there's a negative adjustment made when there's no parking. Only if there isn't. Okay. Yeah. But it's, a, it's just a super there will be parking. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. Jesse, do you have your hand out? Do you want to add something to this? Oh, no. Okay. I'm, I'm ready for the next one. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks. Okay, everybody good on that? Next one is for Langdon. There should be an order on Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Reappraise the contractor set an initial value of $387,800. Uh, again, a change was made in the formal meetings, um, setting the current value at $361,600. Um, it's a two-story two building built around 1850. It's a restaurant, some office space with a total of 4,000 square feet. <laughs> Uh, the building is graded C, it's average, it's in fair condition. Uh, it's given a little bit higher depreciation of 52%. Um, <clears throat> the assessment on this one breaks down to $90 a square foot. Uh, when compared to similar properties of, excuse me, similar location, 
there are anywhere between 81 and 132 dollars a square foot. Uh, those are recent sales, of course. Income on this one. Indicates a value of three hundred and ninety one thousand two hundred versus the current assessment of three sixty one six hundred. Um, equity comparisons. Again, the assessment is um, ninety dollars a square foot. Comparable properties assessed values are between one hundred and sixteen and one hundred and sixty three dollars per square foot. So this one appears to be equitably assessed at $361,600. Um, so the uh, actual income for last year was for $47,300, about $24,000 less. Uh, the taxes were um, $7,000. Uh, 149. 149. So uh, the, uh, the the net income shown here is you know is uh, substantially less half of what they're proposing uh, suggesting for net income. Right. I have an uh, average uh, net income over the course of the three years 2020, 2021, and 2022 it has uh, eighteen thousand four hundred twenty-five dollars. Yeah. Marty, why don't you include taxes in your expense? They are typically not allowed in this type of um, assessment. Um, in bank work, they're included. In assessment, they don't include it. When you say not allowed, is that some legal? I, that I don't know. I don't know if it's in statute. I don't know where it is that says that they don't include it. That I don't know. But doesn't that throw your cap rate? It will. It, I mean, if, you know, like, like uh, with Downstreet, if, you know, if our, our cap rates are, are different, our expenses are different, it's going to throw the assessment way off. So that's one thing we're going to have to um, uh, come to an agreement on is what is, it, what, what is allowed as far as taxes. Yeah. And, and I'll get confirmation again from the contractor of, you know, why they didn't include it. But wouldn't that throw everything off if everybody has been the, the current? Right. The it will. Yeah. Because yeah. so. everybody has not been allowed to count that. So. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Martin, you said several times that the uh, on the equity mm -hmm. tables that the square footage price is adjusted for depreciation on the subject property. It's built in for it. Yes. Is it built into the comparables that are listed as well? Yes. And are they similar to the subject property? Yes. They are. Thanks. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Next up is 70 Main Street. We appraise the contract for set an initial value of $294,800. Um, again, during the uh, informal meetings, a uh, parking adjustment was made, lowering the value to $272,000. Uh, this is a two story building built around 1860 with one restaurant and some office space with a total of 1,965 square feet. The building is created as C or average and is in fair condition and is given a, a fairly high uh, rate of depreciation of 58%. Um, the, the current assessment on it breaks down to $138 per square foot. Um, so as far as comparing it to to sales, it's a little uh, it's a little above uh, current market for sales. Income approach would indicate a value of 
compared to the current assessment of 272,000. Equity comparisons at $138 a square foot uh, when compared to similar properties. Um, they're in the $116 to $264 per square foot range. Um, so this one appears to be equitably assessed at $272,000. Um, the income and equity indicate that it's uh, assessed properly. The, when you compare it to sales, uh, it looks like it might be a little bit high. Any questions on that one? Tim. Question on 68 and 70 main. Mm -hmm. Technically the same building, right? It was kind of. Or am I um, I have them separated. Yes, it's, yeah, it's not that. It's, it's the notion of 68? Yeah, separate. It's visually, you look at it. It's like one really? of the They look identical. It even looks like. Kelly's window is in my office, but it's not, it is not there. There's two separate buildings. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Do you have a comment on this one? Uh, yes. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we we own we own this building and we own both of the businesses that are in my management office. Operates out of a little office up on the second floor there, and uh, we have owned Chattelio Bar for forty five plus plus years or so. Um, so what we did because we we essentially leased those back to ourselves is we um, we revised uh, what the actual uh, expenses and income of the building were to take into account uh, someone else renting those and we put a value of eighteen dollars a square foot on uh, the restaurant space uh, and we put um, a value of uh, $10.50, uh, I believe, is what we did for uh, C-plus office space above the dive bar. It's, uh, it's humble up there. So uh, we, and we, can, we come up with um, net, uh, average net income, even with uh, the recalculation of, of those values at, um, Let's see, where are we here? 70 Main Street, uh, $16,443.50 for cents annually, uh, adjusted for someone else to own the building and, or someone else to lease those spaces. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood maybe what you said. Mm -hmm. You own the business and the building. That's right. And so the, the businesses uh, do lease space from the building. Um, but but I give myself a discount, essentially. Yeah. So what we did is we, we revised that to account for what uh, what someone else would rent those spaces for, and that increased the income. Um, Eighteen dollars a square foot for restaurant space seems to uh, be fair market value, and the office is, is not nice, so it's on the lower end of what office rentals are are. Are we put ten fifty a square foot? I'm sorry. One other question. No, please. Just so uh, the income from the bar is that included in the? No, that's just the income from the bar. The bar is a totally separate business. But you own it. I do. Yeah. yeah. That one sounds like it. Yep. Okay. Uh, next is two to four Spring Street. Um, Reappraise a contract for set an initial value of seven seventy six eight hundred. Uh, again, during the uh, informal meetings, they made an adjustment for condition to. I'm sorry, Marty. What one yeah. are we on? Uh, two to four Spring. Two to four Spring. Okay. 
uh, lowering the value to seven hundred and fourteen thousand. Uh, this is a property with two buildings: a brick building, a wood construction building on Spring Street. Um, <clears throat> one of them is built at, built around 1900, two residential units, one office unit with 2,763 square feet. The other building has 2,762 square feet. The brick, excuse me, the brick building is, is graded as C++, is an average good plus construction, so they're calling it a very good uh, build, and is in average condition. Total depreciation on the, on the brick building is 33%. Uh, the wood construction building is graded a C plus for an average plus for quality, and is given a low depreciation of 14%. Um, total property assessment breaks down to $129 per square foot. When compared to four um, sales, again, from 119 to 161 dollars a square foot, uh, falls well within range uh, when compared to sales. Income approach would indicate a value of 786,100 dollars versus the assessment of 714,000. Equity comps, uh, we have the subject at $129 per square foot. When compared to similar properties, the assessments fall in the $108 to $220 per square foot range. Uh, so it appears that 2 to 4 Spring Street is equitably assessed at $714,000. So again, um, we're not sure where the contractor came up with the gross income. Gross income for last year was actually sixty thousand seven forty-four, about a hundred thousand. The taxes on the building were fifteen thousand five hundred on two buildings. The expenses you'll see on this are uh, the net income is low because of it's two buildings. They each require separate. Uh, insurance policies and separate flood insurance policies. So the expenses for these buildings are very high and has resulted in a, a very low um, net income. Uh, so uh, net, uh, the net income for these two properties over the course of the last three years here is uh, 13700 and forty-two dollars. For both? So for both. As a property, and mm -hmm. as a in as totality, a uh -huh. yes. Okay. Uh, next up is number two months in Crosby Ave. Okay. Monsignor? Oh. Then so the, the next one, 91101, is done yeah. also on the chart. Also withdrawn. Withdrawn, yes. Mm -hmm. Same. And the same with 100 down uh, So that leaves one um, 44 Main Street. Um, we appraise the contractor set an initial value of $741,300. Uh, again, a um, parking adjustment was made during the informal meetings, lowering the value to $692,300. Um, this is a brick building built around 1890, has retail 
and office use for a total of 5,745 square feet. The building is graded as C plus or average plus for quality. It is in average to good condition. It is given a high depreciation for some unfinished in the upper floors. Uh, which will be reflected in the per square foot value of $120 um, of assessed value. So does that mean that that's not finished rentable or usable space on the second and third floors? Correct. Um, if, I can, if everybody can turn to the very last page, you'll see a property record card with a picture of the building. On the left-hand side, you'll see a, a depreciation, the second column over. For um, four items down, they'll say depreciation is a physical condition. There is an adjustment for the upper floors being unfinished, so that is a negative adjustment to value. And then there's also the economic adjustment. Um, that, is a, that is a negative value adjustment for lack of parking. Everybody. Okay with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, income on this one, again as reported, would indicate 799,300 um, versus an assessment of 692,300. As far as equity comparisons, at $120. Per square foot of assessed value, um, it falls at or below typical um, uh, comparables at 108 to 163 dollars per square foot of assessed value. Um, so this one appears to be equitably assessed at 692, 300. Okay. So. Um, you may know the restaurant uh, space that this property has been uh, vacant for uh, three years. Um, I think five. Five, five years, five. 2018. November 2018 was the last time I was in there. And, and so the actual, again, we don't have any idea where they came up with their rents because the actual uh, rent uh, last year was 34120 and we, uh, again, uh, there is uh, now a potential uh, rental of that property. So we have imputed uh, a new rent uh, in our calculations of $36,000. And um, uh, so the, the income will be then projected at $72,000, not $120,000. The taxes on that property have been $15,000. And uh, so, you know, the, you know, instead of their projected income of almost 80000 even with the addition of the rent for the vacant space, uh, we think that, the, you know, the net expenses are more than 36000 Yeah, and actually we, um, actually what, what, I, what I did was uh, on top of the actual rent of 34000 as uh, we added forty-two thousand. We had, we added forty-two thousand dollars. No, and, and a probated tax reimbursement from the restaurant to the to the tune of seven thousand six hundred thirty-nine dollars. And um, even even with adding that income back in, um, which is not insubstantial, uh, we have an an, an average. Net income over the course of the last three years of thirty-six thousand uh, three hundred sixty-eight dollars. Okay. Any questions from anyone on the board? Okay. Thank you. Oh, Bob. Forty-four Main Street. This one's not. It's not.
And, and as we look at this picture, um, how much of this block here is, is the property we're... Uh, sure, the, uh, with all of the white eyebrows. Okay. Yeah, it's good. what it is, but uh, it is, uh, it's a little misleading because the, this building actually only goes halfway uh, through, and then you probably all have sat on the back deck of what used to be the black door there, so you, you know that you're kind of in between two buildings. It doesn't go all the way back to the rear parking lot. Okay. But you've got a tenant now. Oh, gosh, thank you. Yes. That, yeah. That's great, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so do you, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, a quick summary. One of the things that we did not address at the beginning, and I think it is uh, significant in regard to expenses, is that, as you know, these are mostly old buildings. They are mostly all on the National Register of Historic Places. The uh, cost of expenses, uh, the expenses in maintaining them are high. You know, your typical new, you know, this isn't city center. This is a, these are a series of old buildings that take a lot of cost to maintain. And, um, you know, as we all know from the pandemic, what has occurred with the cost of carpenters, electricians, plumbers, HVAC people, they've gone up. And the, the problem, as I said earlier, is that so many of the comparables are looking backwards. If you look at the comparables from 20 and 21, at that point, interest rates were much, much lower. Um, and the costs of repairs were much, much lower. And therefore, you know, there is um, a much difference now in looking at, also as a result of the pandemic, unfortunately, restaurants and offices and retail are increasingly being challenging for rentals. Um, the, the rates are going down. Places are uh, being vacant longer, and therefore, you know, the issue again is what would a willing buyer pay a willing seller on April 1st of 2023 in looking at these buildings and evaluating them? We have in the last column of uh, this chart that we gave you what we think um, would be a fair estimate of what uh, somebody would actually buy the buildings for if they were even willing to buy uh, them, uh, uh, given the knowledge that they would have uh, about the downtown uh, of, of Montpelier at the time. So um, we know this is a lot of detail, and we know that we're really challenging this appraisal company's evaluation. And uh, we, we apologize that we did not uh, get all of this material uh, to uh, the assessor earlier in the process so it could be processed and, and understood. But hopefully um, in, the, uh, in, in this time that we'll all you know, uh, uh, look at the, the, the materials that we're willing to, uh, to submit and um, hopefully you know, we can fairly evaluate the property. I don't know what you want to do about uh, inspections. We're willing in, to waive them uh, if need be. I think you all know most of the properties. If there are any particular properties that anybody feels that they need to see, we'd, we'd be glad to do that. But uh, in order to keep the process going, we're, we're also glad to, to waive the inspections as well. Okay. Uh, We're going to pause. Yeah. I just wonder if I can get in just for the record since we breezed by the 14 day deadline um, issue uh, for the hearing. Um, just you know, a quick response for the record the working backwards 
uh, from the state of emergency, it actually, wait, you all got the statutes with you. And in fact, this is from consulting with uh, the LCT attorney in the past, again today, and the materials I have that look like they're from a, a PowerPoint, they are, but from the training materials that the LCT uses. Um, that actually the, in the Title 20 here, the state of emergency, we're authorized. It, uh, it isn't only applying to licenses, permits, programs, or plans, but in fact it says extend any statutory deadline applicable to municipal corporations, provided that the deadline does not relate to a license, permit, program, or plan issued or administered by the state or federal government. And then just really underlying that, what's more important is we don't even get that far because um, in Title 32, that 14-day deadline is automatically extended. Um, it's the several dates fixed on law before which hearings upon such grievances shall be closed and meetings of the Board of the Civil Authorities shall be held to consider the same. In towns of 5,000 or more inhabitants, it's extended by 50 days, which would actually put the deadline into November. So just, just to make sure I get that out. And that doesn't even get into the reason why the deadline was set as it was, which I know Marty had conversations with the attorney about too. But I just wanted to make sure that was out there. This well covered territory. Thanks, John. Uh, Donna. Do we need a motion? Well, let me, I, that's what I was just going to uh, address. Um, in, in scheduling this, I talked to Mr. Murphy hmm, three or four weeks ago, something like that, and uh, to, to clarify what the, in his view, the issues were uh, in these appeals, and that uh, he indicated that he did not think that the issues raised by these appeals were such that uh, they would be addressed by inspection, committee inspections of these buildings. And so he told me then, and he again uh, reiterated that, that he, the taxpayer was waiving the appeals for the necessity of doing an inspection of all of these properties. Uh, we might need to make an exception for 70 Main Street. But, uh, <laughs> You can all visit that location on your own, but but uh, we're open. Please come. I'm I'm glad you're open. I think that's great. Yes, um, but so I think that uh, I don't think we need to do inspection committees, but I do think we, you know, we're not in a position to make a decision tonight, and I think that uh, we probably want to. Uh, appoint a committee to evaluate all this information and come up with a proposed, uh, or with a set of proposed uh, <coughs> evaluations for all of these properties. And I would suggest more than a three-person committee because there's so much to deal with here. Um, can I just ask a clarification? So the committee would essentially be looking at the discrepancy between the income and the tax thing that they're saying is not fair to... That's basically the work of the committee, right? It sounds correct, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's right, yeah. <laughs> all the other information they provided about vacancies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, it's all part of the income. income. Property, it's yes. all part of the income, though. I mean, if it's yeah. empty, they're not making money, so that would be reflected in their income. I still, you know, I always harp on this, but I'd still be comfortable making the motion if we skip inspections, just to have it on the record. Yeah. Okay. Do you um, want to make that motion? Sure. I'll move that with the agreement of the appellant under the authority granted to the Board of Civil Authority under the Governor's Executive Order number 0323 and the Declaration of Montpelier is being subject to an all-hazards event. Inspections for the properties at 1860 Main Street, 15 Berry Street, 9698 Berry Street, 104 Berry Street, 98 Main Street, 94 Main Street, 139 Main Street, 5 to 7 State Street, 41 State Street, 58 State Street, 49 Greenwood Terrace, 4 Langdon Street, 70 Main Street, 2 to 4 Spring Street, 
and 44 to 45 Main Street be waived. And I would just mention, my understanding is that uh, 1860 Main Street is withdrawn. Oh, is that one of the ones? That, that, that was said. the uh, okay. Carl Hammers. Did I get property. all the, oh, okay. And a couple of those properties are not mine. I'm not sure who's there. Oh, I must have just done a quick cut and paste. And of all of them. My bad. Yeah. And if you I said 45 that. Terrace Street, that also has to come out. Right. Okay. Right. Is there a second? I'll second. Yeah. I'll double check that. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and everyone. Thank you so much. A, a volunteer board. We really appreciate that. You now to volunteer and spend your evenings here uh, doing this for a period of time. And particularly <laughs> the reappraisal. Re it's, it's a big commitment. So. so, who would like to be on on this committee? <laughs> and I, I told John that I would volunteer to be on this committee. Uh, <laughs> Donna. What, what is this committee going to do since there's no inspection? I think you're going to sit down and go through all this stuff and come up with a recommendation on all these properties. So a separate recommendation for each property? I think, I think you're entitled to a separate yeah. determination of each property. Jude, you're saying yes too. Yes. <laughs> Cursing yourself as you head into the list. As long as there's not just three. Yeah. Uh, right. We're going to have more than three, right? We're going to have more than four. Yeah, yeah. Four. that's four. That's four. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, just two. Any going once? Any, any other takers? Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Based on. <laughs> the completion of our business for tonight, we will be in recess at 8.32.